but it's not always about the back. So you can have back pain, but it might not be the back that actually needs to be treated. So what we use is a series of control centers and as you may recognize this as the Czech totem pole, and the Czech totem pole represents the hierarchies of survival reflexes. And what that basically means is the higher a system is on the Czech totem pole, the more important that is for human survival. So the more important a system is for human survival, the more the body will ensure that that's in a correct position, and what it will tend to do is to sacrifice systems lower down in order to keep that system in place. Now what you might also see here is that the lower back is actually right at the bottom of the totem pole. It's part of the slave joints and other systems which I'll come on to talk about in a moment. So right at the top of the totem pole we have the psyche. So the psyche is everything that's non-physical of us. So the reason why that's at the top of the totem pole is because if you didn't want to live, you could effectively end your life. So it could also be that at a subconscious level, the reason why we're in pain is because there are certain things that our subconscious mind is trying to make us aware of. So for instance, in some cases, I've certainly seen where I've had clients that they're in pain, and one of the reasons they're in pain is because that's the only way they tend to get attention from other people. So they will do everything they can subconsciously to remain in pain because otherwise they feel frightened that they're not going to get attention from anybody else. So they might have a whole series of health professionals helping them and that's their way subconsciously of, of gaining attention. Next we have the respiratory system. So the respiratory system is second in the totem pole and the reason it's so high up is because you know, if you don't breathe for more than three minutes then brain cells begin to die. So the body will do everything it can to ensure you're able to respirate effectively. There are a number of things that can affect respiration, so poor posture is one. Food allergies and intolerances can be another one because they can cause your nose to become blocked and then again you can't breathe effectively and then you have to start breathing through your mouth. Poor exercise technique combined with incorrect breathing patterns. So for instance there are some forms of Pilates that teach an inverted breathing pattern. Also rigid and immobile rib cages uh, again can affect your breathing. It's really important to understand that the abdominals are stabilizer muscles primarily, but they have a secondary function as respiration muscles. So whilst the abdominal muscles really do help to stabilize the lumbar spine and the rest of the body, they do also serve to, to help with exhalation. So as the abdominals contract, they create more intra-abdominal pressure and that helps to release air from the lungs. Whereas the diaphragm is primarily a muscle of respiration, but secondarily, it's also a muscle of stabilization. So the rib cage is a very large muscle, and what you may have noticed is that if you lift a relatively light load, you can, you can breathe normally. But once you get to a point where you lift a, a certain load, let's say 60% of your 1RM, you might find that you know, if you go any heavier, you might find that you need to halt your breath to lift the load efficiently. And that's because it's more important to the body to protect the spine and the spinal cord, or perhaps, you know, prevent a bulging disc, because if you're living in the wild and you, 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 you uh, damage a disc, then obviously you won't be able to hunt effectively, you won't be able to avoid predators effectively. So your body will do everything, even over right breathing, in order to make sure that the spine and the spinal cord is nice and safe. Next we have mastication, which involves the whole of the jaw, the teeth, and the reason that's so high on the totem pole is because you have to be able to eat to survive. So anything that causes an imbalance in your bite or your occlusion, so anything that means that your teeth don't fit together properly, 
immediately sets you up for compensation patterns throughout your body. So what we have here is uh, an old client of, of Paul Checks, and he grew up with a quite severe crossbite. So what you can see here is, as an early, in, at an early age, he actually grew up where his bottom canines actually sat outside of his top canines. Now if you try and do that right now, you'll find that that feels very, very uncomfortable. And what you can see from, from the slide there is that his crossbite actually caused a number of um, compensations in his posture, which of course is going to mean that you know, his lumbar spine isn't in an optimal position and could potentially cause lower back pain. I mean, this guy actually had headaches, but it could also have caused lower back pain. So if you don't correct someone's bite that has lower back pain, it might be that you may never fix their lower back pain. So one of the things that's really important to assess is someone's bite and if their bite is faulty then again it must be corrected either if you know how to do it or referring out to the appropriate professional. Then we have the visual and vestibular systems. So your eyes and your, your ears or the, the balance sensors within your ears, they work together to always try and maintain a horizontal vision. So your eyes should always be level with the horizon, as should your ears as well, because they're helping you to balance. And the reason that's so important, again, is because if you're going to hunt and if you're going to avoid predators, you want to be able to balance the body effectively. What you don't want to be doing is chasing after your, your meal and your, your balance is very poor and you end up falling over, etc. So you know, our whole body is programmed to see where our enemies are, where our friends are, and where the things that we need to eat are. So everything below the head will do everything it can to make sure that the head is on straight. So when your eyes don't focus correctly, the brain tries to calibrate the lens of the eye by tipping the head. The reason is because the muscles of the eye are the same as the muscles in the rest of your body, they're skeletal muscles. The vestibular system is your balance centre and tells your brain and your head where your body is relative to the head and where the head is relative to the body. So balance is very, very much tied in to vision and the vestibular system and the vestibular system can lead to poor balance and dizziness. So again, if we're not looking at these areas, it could be that someone's back pain is never going to be fixed. So next we have the cranio-occipital system. So the, so the upper cervical spine is loaded with proprioceptors. It's believed that about 70% of our proprioception comes from our suboccipital muscles. Now, the reason that we know that is because there was a lot of research done on monkeys and they put anaesthetic into different areas of the spine and it wasn't until they got beyond the level of C4 that it didn't really have much of an effect. As soon as they started injecting the upper cervical spine, what they found was that the monkeys weren't able to um, swing through the trees effectively, they kept falling off, they kept falling over. So it has a real, real huge effect on the rest of the body. So any issue in this area increases your risk of athletic or work-related injury since you can't tell effectively where you are in space and time. Next we have the visceral system, the internal organs. So here again is a very important part of the body. One of the important aspects that needs to be understood is the aspect of viscerosomatic reflex. So if there is an organ in the body that's inflamed or diseased, it will send a signal through the spinal cord up to the brain to make the brain aware of that. The brain will often send a signal down the same channel of the nervous system, but it tends to send the signal back to the muscular system. The response of the muscular system would either be to spasm or to inhibit that muscle. So what you might get as an example, if you had someone who had a food intolerance, they get inflammation in the small intestine, and then the abdominal wall becomes inhibited, in particular the type 1 muscle fibres. 
So what can happen over time, whilst they can contract the muscle, it might only be their fast twitch muscle fibres. Now the problem with that is, is that fast twitch muscle fibres don't have a lot of endurance. So if someone needs to stabilise their spine for a long period of time, but they can only contract their type 2B muscle fibres, then the amount of stability they can get will only last for a short period of time. That's going to leave their lumbar spine unstable and it's going to increase the likelihood of injury. So again, anyone with any kind of lower back pain, if you're not looking at their diet, if you're not looking to see if they've got any level of inflammation or disease at the viscera, again, you might be missing a really important aspect of helping them to heal their lower back pain. Next, we have the limbic system. So we always need to look at how stressed an individual is. What's the interpretation of their environment? What might be stressful for you might not be stressful to them and vice versa. So we always need to consider how much stress a person is under and the amount of stress that any person is under is going to have a direct effect on what kind of exercise they can do. So the more stressed someone is, the lower their ability to handle exercise intensity is going to reduce. Next, we lead, need to look at the sacro-occipital system. So what we know is that there's an intimate relationship between the upper cervical spine and the lumbar spine. And we also know that the spinal cord attaches to the sacrum and it also attaches to the atlas. So if we've got any kind of rotation at the atlas, then what the, the uh, pelvis will do will also create torsion and the reason it will do that is because if it doesn't the spinal cord um, will, will be rotated and again it will be creating um, stress through the spinal cord and the spinal cord does not like any kind of stretch stress going through it. So someone could have lower back pain because they have torsion going through the pelvis but if you don't look at the relationship between the lumbar spine and the upper cervical spine Again, you could be overlooking a really important aspect that the person is going to need to ultimately heal their lower back pain. And then finally, we have the slave joints. Now, the slave joints include the lower back, but it also includes everything below the upper cervical spine, the arms and the legs. So it includes the shoulders, the elbows, the wrist, the hip, the knee, the foot and the ankle. So the reason why these are called slave joints is because they are a slave to everything else above it on the totem pole. So whether it's the jaw, the vision, the vestibular system, the upper cervical spine, etc., all those things could cause a slave joint to compensate to make sure that the systems above it are in their optimal position. So whilst we might need to do some work locally on a slave joint, we do need to check all of the other aspects of the totem pole to ensure a holistic approach and to make sure that we don't overlook any of the potential causes of the lower back pain.